Welcome to Wildspire. You get to be a fly on the wall for my intimate conversations with entrepreneurs who are changing the world. I'm your host, Stephanie Benedetto, coach, storyteller, and unmarketer at The Awakened Business, helping coaches and change-making entrepreneurs unleash their inspired message and share it with playful unmarketing. I'll ask curious questions and explore uncharted waters with my guests today. Anything can happen when we step into the unknown of infinite creativity, and that's where we're going to play. Welcome to today's exploratory conversation with my guest, Julian Giacomelli. This conversation left me pondering some really beautiful questions. I love the way we entered it. I love the way we we moved from it. And I'm really happy to introduce you to Julian. So let me tell you a little bit more about him. Julian is a developmental coach for mission-driven entrepreneurs seeking next-level leadership tools and connectivity. He has spent over two decades at the heart and nerve center of building conscious, progressive businesses while supporting their communities. He co-founded Montreal-based Rise Kombucha and Crudescence, leading in the groundswell of clean and healthy food business. Julian has mentored founders and stakeholders in over 100 high-impact startups and taught entrepreneurship through the structure of MBA programs and in grassroots settings. He's also invested in a number of other progressive food and beverage companies. Two years ago, Julian pivoted his work to focus exclusively on human development. He founded Heart of Impact Leadership, through which he coaches leaders and does group facilitation, training, and leads events, all in service of integral organizational health. In addition to running his own coaching practice, Julian works with some of Canada's leading impact accelerators as a mentor and leadership development guide. Now, this conversation has pretty much nothing to do with business, but everything to do with enjoying a life and a business that you choose to create. So I hope you enjoy it. Meet Julian. Why, hello there, Julian, and welcome to the Wild Spire podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. Good morning, Stephanie. I am, I don't know if I'm equally excited because I can't tell for sure, but I'm pretty darn excited to be here with you. <laughs> oh, I love that smile on your face. That's beautiful. I feel it. So as we were sort of settling in for this conversation, you mentioned something that really had a feeling for me. And that was, there's, you said there's a bit of snow on the ground where you are, that there's this feeling of winter coming and going inside. And it felt nice. It felt nice. It felt like something you were enjoying. I was imagining you're enjoying it. And I definitely enjoyed it as you said it. So I'm wondering what you see as enjoyable and valuable about that in whatever way you want to take that question is perfect. <clears throat> well, just for listeners, you can picture I'm in not far from Montreal. So we've just got, in the last couple of weeks, the beginning of what you might call consistent snow on the ground. So it's not super deep, but there's now a blanket of a couple of inches. Um, and there's something super calming about this time of year for many reasons. One is the days are getting shorter, which is not always fun. It's kind of like, ooh, less sunlight, but it does invite in a certain... Well, going inside to me, for myself, just calming down, slowing down. And then in particular about the snow, it's like we go from this wild season of everything falling apart, leaves, and and then it's all, and it's kind of messy and muddy and mucky. And then the snow comes and it's a bit frozen, so it just kind of covers everything. So it feels more calm. Um, and... In this, you know, in particular November, getting into December, is it, you know, it can be tough for some folks that, with the less light, but for me, it's an invitation to go in. And in a, in a sense, the, I view it as the real um, kind of beginning of a new cycle. 
to be honest, it's not January, which is a bit arbitrary. It's more like when the things have all died and are being laid to rest. So now we're in that real true beginning of rest, uh, which, which is uh, awesome for us as part of nature. And so, and today in particular, you know, what I, I love clear days, most days, and you're in Portugal, so you get a lot of those, but where I am, it's pretty clear a lot, but when it's a cool, clear day and there's, and the sun came up, you know, maybe an hour ago over the snow and it's just so calm and peaceful. It's beautiful. Yeah. That's what I got. Mm. It's beautiful. I'm wondering, Julian, how, I, I know that you're, from what we've talked about, you're doing work with serious, um, executives, entrepreneurs, people who are up to big stuff in the world. And I'm wondering how you see this, this sense of presence that I'm experiencing with you, this call to go within the seasons of nature. Like, how do you see that play out in a way that really benefits your clients? Hmm. Great question. And I want to just say that, um, and it's a thing I've been playing with lately. Like oh, there's nothing serious about me. It's all playful. So I, I, I love that you use the word serious because I know well, what I you mean. Serious. I know. And it, it, it gives cause for a little giggle for me. So I'm not sure where it came from. It goes too sideways, but there was something that I just heard or read lately that it was, it's like, are you serious? No. Okay. Thank gosh. At least we can be playful. So Yes, I work with some of my clients are up to big things. Um, some aren't in the sense that I work with a variety of folks, but perhaps my most coveted clients for me anyway, is when I get a chance to work with entrepreneurs that are really entering a pretty, pretty large scale with their businesses. And this might be 30, 40, 50, 60 staff and growing quickly. And so in that sense, I get what you mean that they're, they're onto something bigger <clears throat> which which really asks of them a pretty steady effort level and it's not a low effort level it's pretty high and it's interesting because as, as i pictured what is seasonality and ebbs and flows in a sense it's very difficult and one of the things that's the most debilitating about business especially as we scale is that there's no breaks um, it re does require a constant effort, which doesn't really work with life sometimes. And so when, when you ask me that question, I, th I think my answer, and, and it's still a work in process, is to find ways to invite them in in their personal effort level and, and in relationship with their business to find some cyclicality. So even though it may not be the way that I receive it, is to say, can you find moments in the cycle of the business where you can be more reflective and can be more, um, not just planning, but, you know, looking back as to what's going well and looking forward as to what we're creating so that it's not just an all out all the time effort. Cause that's a, a recipe for, uh, you know, d difficult times for everyone. And so I think, yeah, I, and I love it because in fact, it'll, it'll guide me a little bit in the next few calls that I have with clients around, just that exact point of how can we make the most of this time and be okay with things, maybe being a little slower, being a little more uh, thoughtful. And these moments give us a chance to look forward a little bit and to imagine what we need to do in the next up cycle. And I mean, you know, a second answer to that question, especially around presence is I'm always inviting my clients. I mean, our calls together are a time where they can be, ideally in full presence and see what that feels like and a chance to take a rest from all the overthinking. And I invite them a lot to find their own moments in the day to be in nature, um, to get some exercise, to get some fresh air as a way to replenish and nourish um, what they're up to, about how they are. Thank you. It's interesting as you say that about scaling and it requiring a constant effort that and I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but a constant mm -hmm. effort that really isn't how we perform as humans. You know, we have these rhythms, we have these daily cycles, we have seasonal cycles, we are nature, not constant. 
I've seen that as a misunderstanding that people often have if their energy level is low or down, they think like, I want constant energy, like that that's possible. Mm -hmm. There's some kind of myth out there and I have yet to see it certainly in myself and I've yet to see it in someone else that their energy doesn't naturally fluctuate. Mm -hmm. And yet there's a way that I can relax into it, notice the energy, like notice the seasons And the energy that I need for what's mine to do is there for me now. It's not necessarily what my intellect thinks should be there. It's not what maybe some book guaranteed or some course that I took, like constant energy, whenever you need it, just reboot yourself, you know, like Mm -hmm. mm, maybe. But I also see how quickly that can shift. So I might be having a, a low moment and I don't, I very rarely think to cancel or reschedule things with people because I know that unless it occurs to me to do that, I show up and the energy is there for me because I'm present. When I'm present, the energy I need for what's in front of me is available. And I'm wondering if that sparks anything in you or if you see that in what you do. Yeah, I would I would say that largely I'm I mirror <clears throat> your perspective there about my own energy and and being okay to follow it. Um, and in fact, what we, what came up as you were first talking and this idea of sort of constant energy. Okay, so sure it exists in a couple of places in nature, and maybe the only one I can think of is the sun, but the sun's a very particular. Thing. It's a, it's a constant chemical reaction that's just burning, and that you know that's okay. But it, in a sense, it's we're very different from the sun. Like maybe the sun's in us, but of all the elements around us, um, we are much more prone to cycles. And the only thing in, in in our worlds that tend to have constant anything are man-made, especially machines. And the truth is, even machines need a break, and even machines do better with up cycles and down cycles and maintenance. Um. And I think that it's really great to name that honor. And I'd love to, you know, and I'd love to find ways to invite even my more, you know, everyone's a bit stressed, but what I would call high demanded leaders who are in these scaling moments where really the extent to which they can give constant high energy is helpful, right? So the, 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 they're, they're optimizing for that. And yet I think it's still a great invitation and it has to be that people need to go in their cycles and take breaks on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual um, basis. Um, And in so doing, you know, I often try to work with the quality of our presence and our output rather than the the, the, the absolute amount. So is it, you know, I, I would say it's better to give eight hours, even eight hours of pretty hard energy is hard for the course of the day, but it's better than 12 hours of energy where we're a little scattered we're dropping balls. So can we increase, you know, relatively and not to maximize, but optimize the quality of what we're up to by in fact, bringing in more cyclicality, pauses, breaks, moments of reflection. And that's a hard sell to folks that feel that they, they just always have a to do list that's longer than they'll ever complete. And that's actually the beautiful work that I'm up to, which is that folks mm-hmm. who start to get that and can enact that and can can live that way, don't even argue. It's like, well, of course, that makes sense. You know, if, if you take a break and go for a walk, you might realize that three of those five things on your to-do list could be skipped and you've saved an hour with a 10-minute walk and you have five minutes longer. Um, so I really, really like that. Uh, and, you know, yes, it's it, in, in bringing our natural selves to the world, we do well by honoring and and tapping into those beautiful cycles that we're part of, as opposed to denying them. And then, you know, that can cause disease and all that. Mm. I see this come up in the conversations I have with people too, that there is this belief, I'll call it a misunderstanding again, because That's what I see it as, that we have to be in this 
state of push, drive, stress in order to get things done. And that more is better. More time means I get more stuff done, mainly because it does seem to reduce some of the pressure in my head about if I relax, then, oh, I can't, I got to do this. I got to do this. Like, so it's almost like it, it's self-perpetuating in that way. It just keeps fueling that drive to do more and more and more. But what I see in my life, and it has been an experiment, something I had to see from the inside and that I now explore with other people is that it's not like one unit of, of time input is not equivalent to another unit of input at a different time because of our changing energy levels, because of circumstances, because of the momentum and flow of life. So that on one day, I might be engaged in activity for eight hours and really have a hard time because my bandwidth is low or I'm stressed or just things aren't going well. And on another day, I could be engaged in activity for one hour and it seems like I've done a week's worth of stuff. So it isn't what is the word I'm looking for? It, it doesn't, it's not a mathematic equation in that way. There's a, there's a way to feel our way forward in life through presence is one way to think about like, what is the season I'm in? What is asked of me in this moment? What is mine to do now? When I can drop all of this thinking about it, there's only what's mine to do. And what happens when I'm not stuck in my thinking, when I'm not running, running, running things through my head, is that I have more bandwidth. That's a universal for all humans, right? Like when we're not stuck in this go, 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 constant running in our heads of shoulds and have tos and musts, there's more energy available because I'm not using it up in that stressful thinking. And so I become more productive with less effort, with less energy expenditure. Um, I'll pause there because I, I want to see, are, are, what do you see about this, Julian? Do you see this? Do you see different things? Yeah. I, you know, it's funny that there's a bunch of, there's two or three different ideas that I think are coming to mm. play here for me. And I, if you permit me to bring them all and try yeah, to please. overlay them. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, the first one that came was something that, that, again, has been coming up a lot in, in my worlds these days, which is, um, it's like a meta idea. And you named it in a little bit as, as to how you, you saw something. It came from the inside, is what you said. And this is, uh, I think there's a fellow, I'm sure you probably know of him and some of your folks listening, Michael Beckwith, who does a lot of work with Agape. And he might have been the first to coin this, but I don't know. I've seen it come up a lot, which is these four phases of spiritual growth. And really, it they describe our relationship to the world in a very simple way. And the first is, and it's never linear, and it doesn't mean that we're always in one of these four over constant times, so we might jump back and forth. But one of the ways, which is the lowest form, in a sense, is the world happens to me. It's really the victim mentality. I don't feel like I have much agency where I'm just in this flow and everything happens to me and I react and, um, and that's okay. There are times when that happens and I'll come back to that with my third principle. I wrote three things down. So the second is we get into this strong agent world where it's like, I make the world happen. The world happens by me. And it's powerful because you move from victim mentality into one of feeling like I can do. But the problem with this mindset is of course, when I stop doing nothing happens. Because if I am an independent, this is a bit Newtonian physics. This is like if I'm a separate, you know, fully enclosed a billiard ball bouncing up against others, then in fact, all of what happens to me is my will. And, and I have to be out there doing. And that's where we can be in that mindset that you spoke of, which is, well, it's true. But if I stop, I nothing happens. And the third phase, which which I think 
you know, I dance a bit with, and if, if I'm honest, I'm not saying I'm further evolved than anyone, but I'm, I'm in this place of the world happens through me. And it's much more a state of co-creation where yes, there's efforting and yes, there's will and volition, but it's less a feeling of like deep, deep efforting. It's one more of like, oh, I'm working with what comes up. And so it's a little dance or a nudge as opposed to like, I must push this ball up the hill. And then just to mention the fourth, and I, I, you know, I can't speak too much about it experientially, although maybe there are little wisps of it, but it's the world happens as me. And it's kind of the true non-dual where, you know, I don't have to do anything and we're just the flower. So, but we can put that one to the side for now. I feel like it's probably a few people only and only some of the time. So that's the first thing that I would say is that if we can, as I've been able to try to intentionally develop, and I don't know if I intentionally developed it, but through intentional work and practices, there's more of a feeling like the world happens through me. There's generally less efforting than when the world happens like by me or um, yeah, I make the world happen. Now, even in that, so that was my the, the first principle, which was this these four stages. And it's interesting to note that because if we're stuck in victim mentality, then none of this is relevant because it's all just bad shit happening to me all the time. Excuse me for the swearing. Um, the second thing that I would say, like no matter what phase we're in, whether these are phases or stages or or constructs, the world happens in in like waves of compression and expansion. There are days when everything just feels harder, right? Like no matter, even if it's just like it's co-creation, but like whatever, the I spill the tea, you know, I bump someone in the car, like I'm late already. So even if I'm, oh yeah, the world happens through me, but it's like actually I'm, there's a lot of efforting. So I think it's great to recognize these waves of compression and expansion that may be daily, they may be hourly. And they're kind of independent of our mindset, I think. You know, they're kind of, it is coming a little bit outside of us. Um, and then the third thing that that maybe brings it all together is that, <clears throat> you know, through presence, it's true what you say, that if we're really present to what's arising, we can react better. However, the more we impose on our life through schedule and commitments, the harder it is to be in the flow. And this is what's tricky, right? So what I mean by that is, you know, if, if you are a dentist and you have an appointment at 9, 10, 11, and 12, you know what you're doing at 9, 10, 11, and 12, right? Even if you don't want to, even if you don't really feel like you could or should. I think this is the tricky bit, whereas a lot of folks have less ability to really gauge the, uh, change their schedule. And we often make commitments to things. and so. It is an effort to get things done when they're somewhat arbitrarily placed on our schedule by us, because we don't know in three weeks how I'm going to feel at 11 o'clock when I say I'm going to go chop the wood. And if I have the ability to move that around a little bit so I can wake up and say, oh, I could, don't need to chop wood at 11, it can be 12 or 1, and that allows me to be more in my presence and, and therefore be in flow. But if, in fact, the more we impose a strict schedule and commitments on us, the harder it is to really attend to that natural flow. So that's what I'm getting from all this is that, yeah, there are, there are moments and there is a, there's a, if we can have a, a moderate amount of scheduling, which allows us the freedom to flow a little bit more in and out of what feels right and wrong. Um, and if we can be more in this place of, of feeling like acting like the world happens through me, there's definitely no question that uh, even time has a different feeling. The, the unit of time disappears when we're in a flow state, which is even a, a more heightened state of presence, time kind of disappears. And in fact, you know, I could be doing a spreadsheet for 90 minutes or I'm one with the spreadsheet and I really love spreadsheets, by the way. So it's not an effort for me when I'm that like I could be like, whoa, I just spent 45 minutes deep in programming cell calculations and I didn't think of the hour. And there could be another moment where I'm trying to write something and in 20 minutes, I will have looked at the clock a hundred times. So our relationship to time has has a lot of, uh, you know, I guess um, elements to it. I like where we're going with this, but yeah, I hope that made some sense. Yeah, it did. May I, may I play a little bit with some of the things that you that Please. you said, Julian? Yeah, the long answer, and you don't have to agree with any of it. Yeah, it's not about agreeing. I just want to see, see, see differently, see more, see open, explore in this. Mm -hmm. So what you said on the, on the one hand, I have had the experience of it. Like I don't 
have control when I put these things on my calendar and I'm forced to show up for them. And as an entrepreneur, I get to be quite flexible. Now, maybe I have appointments with someone like you, like we had an appointment for a call today. And, and you know, that's something that I, I really want to show up for. And when I schedule something for myself, like I'm scheduling sometimes to work on something intentionally, I can flex it. I can move it. I can go with the flow in changing those things. But what I'm finding and what I would encourage other people to explore for themselves is that flow is. Flow is life. Flow is us. Flow is our natural state. And that even if we have a container that it's flowing through, flow, the experience of flow is still available. So even if I'm showing up with a day that's got back-to-back appointments, it doesn't actually limit my experience of flow. It may limit my um, flexibility with changing the form of my day, but the experience of it is always available. And that is not to say that it therefore should be flow nonstop because that's not my experience. And I would never say that to anyone. I think we're, we're designed to feel those ups and downs and you talked about them. You used a different language for them, but, but knowing that flow is available and I can fall into it, which is what I do when I get present. I, I realized at one point that what I was doing with my schedule was I I had a schedule that was full of lots of conversations. And in those conversations, I would drop into presence pretty regularly. So it was nice. It's like I found flow in those, in those hour increments. And then in between, I'd be like, okay, I got to go rush to the next thing. So I'd like pop myself out of flow. Like I got to do, 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 do. And then it would drop into flow again. And when I saw that I was doing it, I was like, why am I doing that? I don't, actually Mm -hmm. like i can flow in the transition i can flow in the busy i can flow in the space because there's always space you know and oh yeah (laughs) yeah i mean i would i wouldn't i I largely agree and i don't know that i would say there's always space because again it has to do with this is the beautiful interplay between like structure Mm -hmm. and surrender and i think that uh, it's it's true to a certain extent, absolutely. And of course, if we impose too much structure, then the, the, it's it's impossible. To, you know, we can flow relatively in those structures, but if there's too much, then it's we we, we cut it off. And I think w- the other thing that came up just that I was going to ask you, it's like if you can imagine, what is it that makes the difference between if you have the same schedule, mm-hmm. you know, spacious enough. One day you are able to flow nicely through most of it and the next day not. Can you name one thing? And I have an answer. I mean, it's like, you know, I have a sense of what it is, but like, Mm -hmm. why is it that we are less able to flow certain times than others? Yeah. Let me see fresh how I would answer this. The difference is what I'm giving my attention to. Yeah. So, yeah, I have this, I have this, it's, it's like there's a buffet of thought available. And if I give my attention to the ones that are, that feel stressful and tense, that's not feeling very flowy. But mm-hmm. if I give my attention to the ones that are, spacious and open and creative that's how i feel and if i drop out of all of that altogether that tends to feel lighter too although sometimes can still be difficult it feels better yeah i mean what i got from what you said and the first answer that i had is simple was it's just the mind like the difference Mm -hmm. between when we're able to flow and not is that flow really requires us to be able to drop out of being distracted by the mind and sometimes that's consequential. Like, you know, what I mean by that is it's like, you know, again, like I'm sitting here trying to flow with you. I've promised, 
you know, my girlfriend, that I'm going to be outside chopping wood in five minutes. Like I, I've made a commitment. This is real in my life. Now I can just ignore it, but it's going to have consequences. So I guess the mind is what we, you know, we're constantly working on, which is how can we, um, it's like, you know, a little bit quiet, the mind to not let the stuff come up as Michael Singer would say, the stuff that we've put in past events, programming that take us out of where we are. Um, yeah, like I, I love that. I mean, it, and it's funny, the last thing you said too, I want to just touch upon it because I think that there's, um, flow is kind of like a middle state between like being over-engaged and being not engaged enough. So I think that if we, you know, you sort of say like, well, we can completely pull out of everything. And in a sense, I don't really view that as flow. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's just kind of like, you can be taking a break and that's flowy. But what I mean is it's sort of like, um, it's coming out of engagement and that's not mm -hmm. necessarily better. It may be necessary. Over-engagement is the, we're trying to do too much and the mind is busy and we're not really flowing. We're jumping, chopping. Flow is that kind of middle state where we're fully engaged with 80% of our capacities in a way we're challenged and we're actually having fun and time disappears and we're single focus. And then the sort of like, it's also, there's a way of being under engaged, I think, where we can be like, I don't really know what to do. So I'm kind of like procrastinating. I'm kind of looking around. I'm picking up this folder. I'm not doing anything with it. I'm putting it down. And again, it's the mind that doesn't allow us to <clears throat> engage. Mm. I want to share a metaphor. This is not my original mm. metaphor, but for Please. what's for the mind. That what's What's available in the mind is uh, it's like the Mississippi River, which is a very powerful river, right? Like there's a lot happening. It's it's not a tiny little trickle. It's not a brook, right? It's very mm. alive, this river. And at the top of the river, there's a lot of chop and turbulence. There's noise. Mm. There's a lot of stuff happening in a way that's kind of chaotic if you were in the river, you know, it might actually be strong enough to sweep you away, right? But if you drop down a good six feet or so, there's a current, there's a flow mm -hmm. that carries you. And then if you drop all the way down to the bottom, it's almost completely still. And that the mind is like that that all these experiences are available for us because our mind is not just the small mind, it's connected to the greater mind, the universal mind. And that when we, where we, where we are, where we bring our attention is what's creating that experience, but they're all available, which is cool. So again, not saying that we should therefore always be in flow or always be able to find it, but for me, when I know I'm in the chop, when I know I'm in the noise, it's really nice to know that that's just where my attention is right now and I can drop. And sometimes just remembering that helps me do it. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I just am not done with it for whatever reason. But knowing that feels, I like this metaphor because I feel it when I say it. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe it's true that there's sometimes we, we need to be in the chop. <clears throat> right? Like that we we are we live in the world where there's a lot of moving parts and we have to coordinate and stuff goes wrong. And you know, we can be very drawn into very um small <clears throat> yeah, like choppy waters. And and I think that I don't know that the goal is or could be with a an integrated life to always be at the bottom of the water where there only is very like laminar flow as we'd say I, I studied civil engineering a thousand years mm -hmm. ago and so i love the metaphor of the, of the river because i understand how it works mm. I mean, it's not that complicated but you named it beautifully um and so i think it's it's like we can be and we can and know should be it would be natural i think for the lives that we live with the things we choose to have a variety of depths but what I liked about what you said is that when you're in the choppy waters, you can remember that this isn't the only way to be and that it's going to pass and that it's, it's okay for now. I'm kind of in this for a little while and in an hour I can be sitting under a tree calmly. 
and return to a more calm place that that is it is necessary i think more than we think to try to be in that place which is more natural for us as well even though we're we're comfortable with the hecticness somehow because we're very versatile uh, mm. creatures yeah i found that there was a habit <clears throat> that i had of feeling uncomfortable if i wasn't in that chaotic mental state mm -hmm. because it meant I wasn't doing something. And if I'm not doing something, then I'm not valuable or, you know, not even consciously thinking that just that habit of thought and that just knowing that something else is available creates relief for me. And I think for a lot of people, it, it, that's where it can begin is like, oh, I mean, I don't have to operate like this all the time. And in fact, you don't. If you look at your day, if I look at any given day, I'm not in that all day long. And in fact, in every day, reliably, at some point when I fall asleep, I'm out of that at the very least. And if I look at any little time, it's like up and down all day long. And like, that's kind of cool to notice. Mm. Yeah, when you were talking about that, <clears throat> maybe it's a slightly different thing that's going on, but my perspective is that a lot of folks unconsciously stay in that crisis mode as a strategy to avoid facing self. Um, distraction, chaos allows us you know, to stay engaged and purposeful and dealing with all the small fires that we're allowing to be created as a way to, <clears throat> if we're not ready or we don't, you know, and again, it sounds like there's some sort of a spiritual ego, but I think that you could agree that ultimately it's helpful, helpful to know that there's deeper ways of being and that that's maybe more our true nature, but that for many folks, when they slow down a little bit, it, it confronts, they can be confronted with all sorts of questions, which they're not ready to look at like what am i really up to and is this the right relationship and why am i doing this job and you know and so there's the, i used to have this mm, a tagline that i took off for what was very confrontational for people at the bottom of my email used to say like what are you waiting for <laughs> like as though as though i knew better i do have this sense that i did have this sense in those days and this was maybe 20 years ago that, that that there was this like you have these little interstitial moments where there's a bit of moment of peace and silence and then it's like holy crap that makes me nervous i don't have any answers to those questions so i'm just going to go back and rush out well then go 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 so that that's my what are you waiting for was an invitation maybe mostly for me to say well i, I guess i'm it's my choice and maybe I don't need to wait any longer to, to start to slow down a bit more consciously and uh, reflect around those questions that really do matter that, that hopefully could guide our life uh, and, you know, eventually, if not, you know, earlier than later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, it is true. I think as I look back in those times when I was really addicted to the busy I think this happens in meditation. You have a lot more experience in meditation than I do, but one of the things that I've heard people need to move through if they're going to stay with meditation, unless they're going to have a hell experience the whole time, is that when you first start to slow down and not distract yourself with doing and external things, you start to listen to the noise in your head all those questions you're saying that what we've been avoiding the noise and it makes sense to distract myself to not have to feel that. And it's uncomfortable at best sometimes to have that happening and think like, I can't turn this off. And if they stay there, meditation is not particularly peaceful, but if you stay long enough, at least coming back to the metaphor, it's like, you stay in the chop, you notice the chop, but you don't have to engage with it at some point, like in, in meditation and mindfulness, it's like watching it, watching it, you begin to observe it more, you observe the chop instead of being buffeted by it. And then you kind of find yourself settling and having a different experience. Um, but 
as I said, you have a lot more experience in meditation than I do in that way. Like, do you see that or something different? <clears throat> yeah, that's astute. That's a, I mean, I think that's an interesting, it, it's, a, it's a good way of putting it, that we, we need to go through that stage. And that, that stage, what I would describe is, um, and again, it's, again, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen to me every single time I sit down to meditate, but that we recognize the nature of the mind is always creating thoughts. And we're not aware of that when we're not meditating because we're engaging in all those thoughts and we're in, in it. So, so, so it is absolutely part of um, the process of meditating, which is becoming comfortable with a very uncomfortable thing, which is we sit down to try to have, a, to try thinking, and it is to some extent the goal, although teachers would say this differently, it is to some extent the goal to be able to eventually sit down and in a quiet mind. But there's a lot that has to happen for that. And the first stage is to recognize that in its current state, maybe wouldn't want to call its natural state, but its current state, it's absolutely chaotic and full of crazy ideas that come and go. And moreover, we also recognize how quickly we get caught up in those thoughts. That's the real first aha moment in, in meditation is that we can see the difference between, like it'll always be milliseconds, if not seconds, when we're sitting where all of a sudden something new pops up, like, oh, I want a pizza. And the, um, the metaphor that I've always loved, which is is to not get attached to the clouds, but to try to be looking for the sun behind it so that the cloud, the pizza thought comes and I can let it go. And it's, and it's been said a million times, so I'm not bringing anything new here. But to your point, it isn't to eventually I think there can be a slowing down of the creation of these thoughts. But that's the longer arc of how do we empty our mind of a lot of the things we've put in it um, through the years. But the first step is actually not identify. The first step is not giving up on trying to sit because it's like sometimes like, oh, that's too noisy. I can't sit. The second step might be um, recognizing that thoughts come and go. And that's really OK. And that's what I'm sitting here for. And it's catching ourselves attached in a way to the thoughts. And then so the third stage might be starting to be able to more and more quickly recognize, oh, yeah, I'm thinking now. You know, like a thought came and I'm instead of letting it go, I've held on to it. And eventually they come and go more easily. And then eventually, eventually, and I'm not really there, but who knows, maybe a little bit, there can be longer periods in the meditation where there actually is a pretty quiet mind. Um, but we can't be attached to that because it, it's it's not really in our control. Some days it goes, it's the compression and expansion. Some days it's just noise on the radio. And some days it's a little bit quieter. And they're both great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's cool that was the phrase you use compression and expansion and i like that because it doesn't have a judgment on it like when things compress or expand it's just like contracting and releasing it's just what happens yeah. it's not good or bad one way or the other it's just the flow the rhythm the way things move yeah that comes a term i mean i'll get this slightly wrong probably but i, I think that it comes at least partly from a beautiful um, late Indian philosophy called Vedanta. It's one of the Vedantas. And, I, and there's a text, it's called the Spanda Kurana. And I, I went there years ago, and I don't remember much about it. It was brought to me by a teacher. It was a I might get this wrong, and I, I'll, I'll correct it and send you a thing if it isn't. But it's really this idea that it's more, and this is really like, this is how the universe works. This is our experience coming to us. Like we're on those moments where we might be sitting in a sunset where it just feels like energy is expanding and expanding and expanding. And there are moments when uh, we are like literally feel like we are being compressed. Like events are happening around us. Things are heavier and there's compression. And that's these cycles of, it's kind of like the mother earth herself is going through these beautiful waves of comp compression and expansion. It might even be viewed as the inhale and the exhale of the, of the universe that we feel. And I love it because it's, it's, uh, it's really, it felt resonant with my experience of the world. And these, these waves can happen meta and also in very small cycles. Mm. Spandokurana. Anyway, I'm 
I'm going to get it wrong. So I won't say any more about the people listening and be like, oh my God, he's really me missing it up. But that's okay. It's deep in my annals of like stuff that I've read briefly, but deeply and stuck with me. Mm, that's beautiful, Julian. I, I have those things come back to me too, but like it touches, like it sounds like it really touched you. And I feel it when you say it and it lives in you now, even if it's not quoted mm -hmm. correctly from the right book or text, right? Like there it is. And it comes from you now, fresh, and to me now, fresh. And yeah, I, I love really, that. I like that a lot. So, mm. I, I want to ask you if there was a message that you'd really love to transmit, like from, from your beingness to someone who might be listening. And that person might even be yourself, right? I find so often the person that I'm speaking to is really me, me as other also. What would that, what would that message be that wants to come through you right now? <clears throat> That's, I think it's, it was easy to come up with a, an answer because it was something that I was thinking about last night and it came again this morning. <clears throat> which is fundamentally you're free and 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 i was experiencing a feeling of const of constriction <laughs> and i recognized that the feeling of constriction was my own doing and so it's this invitation this rem remembering this trying to remember or trying to believe or trying to experience that even within all of our choices, even within all the things we choose, the, the relationships, the jobs, the house, the room, we can experience it from a fundamental place of freedom. And, and that's incredibly, it's great to remember because it brings more, a bit of lightness to, to this experience. Doesn't mean that I can run away from, I've made commitments. It's it's not that. It's it's not like, oh, I'm free to leave at any moment. I mean, although that's also true, right? Like that's partly where it comes from, which is like, actually, if it ever got so bad, the door is open. You know, what's that Rumi quote? Why do we stay in prison when the door is wide open? But that there's something fundamental about our attitude that can be developed, that I am working on developing and then working, this is, is a strong word, but coming to recognize slowly over the years and decades that we can experience a fundamental freedom even within all that we're experiencing and that's our, our birthright that's a gift that we, we we have to access and when we can connect to that and it happens occasionally here and there there's this this is like ah everything is okay it's really it's okay hmm. wow Thank you for that, Julian. It's really lovely. Fundamentally, we are free. Mm. Yeah. So if people listening would love to find out more about what you're up to in the world and connect with you, where is the best place they can go for that? Yeah, I've recently... And I say recently because it's slower going, but it's been a couple of years, but I'm really starting to live in this new body of work and title to my company called Heart of Impact. And so I have a website, heartofimpact.com. That's all one word. And there, it's not particularly dynamic these days, but it does uh, present me and what I'm up to more as a leadership coach. Although I do life coaching as well, it kind of falls within some of the same principles, but it's less discussed on Heart of Impact. And then on LinkedIn, Julian Giacomelli, uh, I'm sure the, the name will be in the title here. And I'm committing lightly to share a little bit more. I, I have this love-hate relationship with these days of, of <clears throat> part of me wants to write. I mean, I do write, but part of me wants to share more what I'm writing. And then I... I feel pressure and I see all these amazing voices out there and I'm like, what do I have to add to this beautiful dialogue? And so, but I, I, and I do commit to starting to share a little bit more um, 
around what's influenced my work and what I've been through, because I feel like I do have some stuff to share. But for now, the website, there's a blog on it, but there's no blog posts. So, mm. so I, I, I have a few emerging posts coming through LinkedIn, I think, where I'm going to start to share a little bit more about my perspectives. And uh, yeah, that's where I could be found. Mm. Awesome. Thank Thanks you, Julie. Asking. And I would personally be very interested in enjoying any of the things you'd like to share around things like fundamental freedom, perhaps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's very beautiful, feels lovely, points me in the direction of presence and truth. I love it. Just giving a little, just in case you want a little note of encouragement, you have one from mm -hmm. me there. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm happy that landed with you because I've been trying to, I used to talk I, I was almost talking about responsibility, which sounds so heavy. I'm like, oh, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it was like, it, it does come from the same place, but it's in fact, or maybe it's almost the flip side. So I'm happy to hear that as a framing, an overarching framing concept as to like what I'm up to in the world. I'd love to say that I'm, I'm helping folks realize, humbly helping folks a little bit realize some part of that fundamental freedom that, mm -hmm. that is their right. Wow. What a gorgeous thing to be up to. Love it. Well, thank you, Julian. Really appreciate this time and your sharing. Well, thank you. I, I've loved our conversations. I love, we didn't, we barely talked about business and I don't know, <laughs> but I love what you're up to and what you are trying to do with your work. And I look forward to continued conversations with you and maybe eventually in person. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me for today's Wildspire conversation. If you'd like to receive a weekly Wildspire email from me filled with inspiring stories, unmarketing experiments, tips for playing your way to impact and income without the hustle and hype, insights from my spiritual business journey, and more, go to theawakenedbusiness.com forward slash Wildspire. Until next time, may you know yourself as the gorgeous wild creation you are.